on any stages of life, know what your pet is thinking is it, so um, valuable. It's so liberating. It's so important. And there's such a room for connection there. So just bringing it in at any stage of your dog's life, I highly recommend it because it will just open your mind to your own life. Welcome to the Pet Care Report podcast by Pet Summits. Here's your natural dog health care host, Alora McKinley. Well, g'day guys. It's nice to have you joining me again for another episode. Today, I'm chatting to Dr. Yushenko, a veterinarian with a lifelong passion for animals and medicine who has always embraced homemade diets and natural remedies for pets. She quickly transitioned to holistic veterinary practice after moving to Canada and becoming recertified in 2007. Currently based in Hawaii, Dr. Yushenko runs her veterinary practice, Path of Bliss Hawaii, offering holistic consultations, herbal and homeopathic treatments, and animal communication. Hi, Dr. Yushenko. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Hi, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, animal communication, can you just tell us how you got started in that? Is this something you've always been interested in? You know, it's something that I, you know, I remember first time I've heard about it. It was maybe about 10 or 15 years ago. A friend of mine had a horse and she said she invited animal communicators to speak to her horse to find out how the situation is in the barn. And um, I thought it was a scam. You know, I was like, for sure, you know, like, it just, I think for sure somebody is just ripping you off, you know, just telling you stories is like sound truthful. But my friend said, no, it just there's no way she would have known what she said. You know, she, she provided such a detailed information. Uh, and I remember it just stuck in the back of my head. Um, but I never thought I would be the one, you know, doing it ever. You know, I was just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm such a down to earth, more physical kind of person, you know, like this, um, that, that seems just a little out of reach, you know, that you can read animals' mind, for God's sakes, you know, <laughs> you can do that. And then um, I started working myself with the psychic healers. And uh, it blew out of my mind because the people were able to read my body like they're living in it. Like they knew more about me than I was aware of myself. And so I, I was opening up to more possibilities. I said, well, it's possible, you know. And then one day I was doing a massage on the dog. And all of a sudden I started getting these images of this dog when she was a puppy. And I was like, whoa, what was that? You know, it was so unusual, you know. But I think the key is that I was being really still. When I was doing massage on the dog, I had to grind my, ground myself and be like really comfortable and really quiet and really still. And when you're still, you start getting that information. So the key first is, is get yourself in the most relaxed, comfortable position possible. The second one is calm down your thoughts so you're not busy thinking. So kind of clear space where information can come in. And the three is when information does come in, trust it. Because it seems so bizarre. So at first you wanted to just dismiss it. So, oh, I just imagined that, you know, it just, it just didn't happen. It doesn't make any sense. You know, it's too weird. But what I did, you know, I, I memorized the information that I was getting from the dog and I told the owners about it because I didn't know enough of the dog to confirm whether it was true or not. But when I told the owner what I was seeing, she confirmed every single image or emotion that was going through this dog mind that she was communicating with me. And I said, oh my god this is this is something else you know this is just they just opened the door after that i just couldn't stop listening so in the same family i'm working the second dog and she's like this little little scruffy little terrier they found on the side of the road and she's telling me she's a princess you know she has this like old prince like she wants golden cushion and she wants this and that and she wants to talk about food you know she gave me a list of food that she likes and i still remember it was green beans was beef, it was omelet and vanilla ice cream. I was like, what on earth, you know? And then I finished the session and I tell the owner, hey, what about this green beans? She says, oh, she just had them for breakfast. I'm like, what about beef? What's her favorite meat? What about the omelet? Or we make it for, for Sunday breakfast and she really loves it. I was like, but vanilla ice cream. And the owner says, oh, I used to have an ice cream shop in tourist area in Waikiki and she would come with me and we'd always share this ice cream together I'm like get me out of here this is just too strange too weird but at the same time it was really interesting so I just kept on listening I kept on listening kept on listening and the more you listen the stronger the voice gonna get so everybody can do that yeah they, we're absolutely all capable we're all psychic we're just not trained to use this part of us 
we kind of shut down our intuitive voice that says, oh, don't take the road, take this road. You know, don't do this, don't take this job, take that job. You know, we're just not trained to think with our, with our intellectual brain, not with our uh, intuitive brain. You know, and I think if we were to tune that intuitive, our life would be better and we could serve our pets better because they are in the intuitive brain. You know, they are going with their emotions. Yeah, that's amazing. And you've done lots of practice in this now. And now you specialize um, in animal communication in terms of end of life care for animals. And we're going to be talking about dogs specifically. Um, can you explain how it benefits dogs, especially during that end of life stage? So I found that... You know, at any stages of life, knowing what your pet is thinking is it, so um, valuable. It's so liberating. It's so important. And there's such a room for a connection there. So just bringing it in at any stage of your dog's life, I highly recommend it because it will just open your mind to your own life, first of all, because they love you unconditionally, care for you so much. It would relieve so much of that pressure of the pet owner that thinks, oh, I'm not doing enough, or I'm not good enough, I'm failing my pet, I should be doing this and all that. And the pets are just, just relax, that I'm all right, you know, just take it easy. So for the end of life, um, it's such a difficult time, you know, in the pet's owner's um, life, because for some reason in, in our Western world, we decided that we are the one making decision when the pet's going to go. And that decision just tortures people, you know, it just, it, it just so much pressure, you know, am I doing it too early? Am I doing it too late? We're, we're kind of playing gods here, you know, and, and what I'm doing is bringing the power back to the animals and saying, hey, you know, your pet wants to go on their own terms. They don't need you planning for it. They don't need you scheduling for it. They don't need you stressing about it. It's a normal p part of life. And the animals have so much more acceptance of dying than we do you know in our, our societies we're scared of death the death is hidden you know we know nothing about it and then the death perceived as a complete failure so if somebody dies or something dies it's 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 disaster to be avoided at all costs so that's how we perceive the death in the western society in western medicine you know the hospital is trying so hard to save you know pets and people make them live as long as they need to that's not what your pets want they don't they Neither want heroic measures trying to save their life unnecessarily. You know, they pay like enormous amount of money doing the surgery when they're like really sick and advanced that might or might not help. They don't want that. And they don't necessarily want to be put down before they're actually ready to go. So given that insight to the pet owners, I think this alleviates so much pressure. And a lot of the time it corresponds with what the owners are feeling themselves intuitively. So they say, oh, you know, it doesn't feel like the right time. And everybody's telling me I have to put her down. Doesn't, you know, doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good because it's not the right time, no matter what everybody else is saying. You know, it's um, our perception of, oh, we have to avoid pain or discomfort, or we have to avoid, you know, debilitation at any cost. Well, the pet says, you know, I'm okay being the way I am, and I would rather be still alive as is than be dead. So have you found in your... Um your communications that this kind of reassurance to owners really helps the grieving process absolutely it just it's just uh, you know lift the burden off from you know beating yourself up for years that you failed your pet to feeling oh we're just on this journey together and my pet hasn't actually left anywhere you know they're still here you know the, the fact that you can connect with them even after they transitioned gives you that sense of relief it's like, oh, nothing, nothing bad happened, nothing wrong happened. You know, they a lot of the time they come back as butterflies or, or birds. So they just, you know, they just give you different signs, saying, oh, look, I'm still there. You know, or they might even come back, you know, and as another animal in your life. Not always, but sometimes they do. Just seeing that the death is not the end, it's just a stepping stone that you're transitioning because the energy is never, you know, the, the energy is never disappearing, just changing forms. So I'm changing form from being this puppy to being this energy is going to be something else. You know, I've seen some animals that just said that they're ready to move on the human life. You know, they like they've gained enough wisdom. They're done with this dog life. They want to be like a person or they've been a person. And now they are having this animal experience. It's just there's so much to it. Wow. Have you seen um, are there some signs or behaviors that dogs maybe exhibit when they're nearing the end that owners can better interpret and understand? I find what usually happens with dogs uh, at the end of life, they start, they start withdrawing. So when your energy diminishing, 
when you you know when you're nearing the end of life you don't don't have enough resources to engage in active play or show a lot of emotion so they start withdrawing and it's normal and natural and it's good to give them space you know sometimes the owners like to fuss around you know the dying pad they want this and that and that and they just sometimes just leaving them alone is all they need and having respectful communication at the distance maybe time together, but not that much in their face. You know, I think that would be really helpful. Just give them a little bit more um, of their own perspective, you know, and they just step back because we're put. you know, we're so worried about them dying. We're putting all our worries on their body while they kind of actually go into a normal process. And um, I find a good sign for the pet owners to know the animal is ready to go is when they stop eating. So that's a key. You know, if your pet is still eating, no matter how sick he might look, they still want to go. They still want to live. If your pet stops eating, they're telling you, you know what, soon I'm preparing to departure, but it still might take weeks and weeks. So just be patient with it and know that the all these are all parts of the natural process. Like the body has to die some way. You know, if you're constantly eating until the last day, it's the body just not going to shut down. You know, you got to give it time to shut down. So just knowing the physiology of death and dying is really important, you know, and then what to expect. And the very last stage is so if you say, for example, going through the natural death at home all the way through, you need to know what to expect in the really final stages when they go through this last agonizing breath. And, the, it, you know, it looks it looks traumatic for the owners. Well, you know, it, it, it is the way the body is just going to discharge itself. You know, they, a lot of the pets, they howl or the, the whole body goes into the stars and this chronic stars when they like extend their their front legs and back legs and you think, oh my God, they're suffering, but this is just how the body is going to transition from life to death. Now, this is not like a bad thing. So just being prepared helps you to be aware and not panic. I can imagine this would be particularly hard um, maybe if a dog was younger because we all think of death, you know, we grow old or animals grow old. Um, and then they pass away. How have you helped um, maybe owners of a younger dog with their transition? Well, with younger dogs, it's usually something traumatic, right? Because they're not, they're usually not dying from, from natural, you know, from natural causes, usually something happened. Uh, with younger dogs, it's usually my work's been to help the owners to accept things as they are. So the accidents, you know, the accidents are never accidents. There's there's a deeper meaning to it. You know, you forgot to close the gate, your dog ran out, gets hit by a car. Who? How do you live with that, right? So like tuning in into the dog spirit, telling the owners why it happened and, you know, where the dog is at right now is really helpful. It just, it just you know, it gives you that, gives you that peace, you know, the feeling of peace that you haven't done anything wrong. There's a bigger forces in play. The things were aligning the way you need to align. Just, I think we're like, as humans, we like to control everything. Well, you know, the universe is much more powerful than we are. So surrendering is like the biggest lesson we can have in our life. So whatever happened to your pet, even, for example, you've done euthanasia, if you like, it's too early, come to terms with it. You see, you can't go back and change it. You've done the surgery for your dog that they died from. You know, just, just let go of the guilt feeling. You cannot go back to the past and change it. There's something else live in play that you couldn't have predicted, that you couldn't, you know, you've done the best you could at the time. Um, just letting go and relaxing and knowing that, you know, we're, we're not like, we're not holding all the strings. <laughs> we're just, we're just like a part of the bigger web uh, and just allow ourselves to, to be pulled in these different things and uh, maybe find empowerment. So for example, if you have a young dog die from cancer, take on this journey, like educate people how to prevent cancer pets, you know, like, how, you know, start your blog, you know, like start putting this information out there, go rescue a dog. Like, what what's what the beauty in it? Just find something beautiful and bring it on. You know that that will help you go, and it will make your pet happy. The one that transition because they'll know like, oh, you're not stuck in grief. The last thing the pets want you is to be sad, and angry, and beating yourself up. It just they just never require it. <laughs> they just never never need it. You know from from the pets. They just they thrive when we're happy. They thrive on the positive emotions. The, the reminder that comes quite often at the end of life from the past is like, hey, you're going to die too. Why, why are you wasting your time now? Your life is not like endless in this, you know, in this body. Like, enjoy it. It's like we're just spending so much time worrying, you know, um, 
obsessing over things, like trying to fix things. Well, like we're here to experience joy. And that's animals are teachers. They show us how unconditional, even like in the most debilitated state, they'll still look at you the way of the tail. And they still find it the biggest presence as they are, no matter what. While we as humans, we want things to be perfect in order to be happy. Just so reassuring, like even as an owner that's lost a dog, if someone had told me that, you know, that that would have really helped me grieving. So that must be really lovely that you can tell owners that. Absolutely. And as a person that suffered terribly from the loss of my own pets, you know, as a, as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, you know, I was terrified of death myself. Like, remember the first time I found out that I'm going to die, I think the world just ended right then. I was like, how is it possible it's going to keep on going when I'm not here? It just was blew out of my mind. And whenever my pets died, you know, some from traumatic things, some from sudden illness, like, I would just remember when my dog passed away, I was 20. I would not let myself smile for a year. I said, I'm not going to experience any joy for a year because my dog passed and I must have done something wrong. You know, that guilt is like somehow, I, well, maybe I didn't take her to vet early enough or maybe I didn't feed her the right foods. Like something I must have done wrong for the dog to die and I must be a terrible person. You know, that's how I used to feel. So being able to transform it and flip it backwards and say, oh, actually, everything was okay. And that was the time for the pet to go. And I did my very best I could. And like telling the owners that it just it just lightened the load so you can keep on going forward. You know, like imagine how many bags of baggage we're carrying with us. You know, oh, I was bad here. I did something wrong there. You know, I failed. It. It's just like we're carrying this massive load of guilt and shame with us. We can just let go. It will shine much brighter. And we will bring more good to the world and to the animals. Mm-hmm. Are there any experiences that you can share with our listeners of how you've um maybe communicated with an animal and helped the owner? Absolutely. That's my favorite story about Benji. Maybe I'll even send you guys some pictures to to illustrate because it's it's a remarkable story. So I get a call from the owner and she says, oh, her dog is getting old. You know, maybe it's time. She wants to have this consultation about the end of life transition because she doesn't know how to decide. So I get there and, uh, you know, Benji is a 15-year-old Maltese, you know, very cute, very perky. And um, we started talking, you know, to the owner. I started, you know, he wouldn't let me touch him. He's this little grouchy little guy, you know, like couldn't put my hands on him to even do an exam. But I said, okay, I'm just going to listen to you. And Benji says that he does not want to die at all, that he wants to go travel, that he's been waiting to travel for a long time, and he wants to go to California, and he wants to go to Europe. He's very specific, and he wants to smell flowers in Grandma's garden, and he has all these very specific details what he needs to do. So I'll tell the owner this, and then we switch, we switch kind of uh, appointment from the dog to the owner. Then I spend two hours with the owner doing the same psychic communication, but for her specifically, uh, and showing her where she's stuck in her life and where she's given up on her life. So the bigger picture is like she kind of shut down her dreams because something didn't work out. She said they're never going to work out. That's the end of it. She'd given up on her life. She started neglecting her own food, started feeding like, less nutritious food to Benji and uh, she just had no no inspiration no things to look forward to so she's given up on herself and she's given up on Benji she thought he's ready to die in fact she already dug a grave for him like when I got there there was a grave dug out in the yard for him that's how ready she was for him to go so we have this session you know after the session the owner comes out to to her front porch she like takes her clothes off and she says that's how I used to feel she just like you know she just completely revamped you know she's like full of energy like she's such a bright positive person so three months later they come in they get health certificate to travel to california so then i get this picture so benji he's going sailing uh in the ocean around california coast (laughs) and then this summer they're going to uh, they're going to europe so that's you know that's almost a year after you know his grave been dug out that's crazy. Um, you know, he's full, of, <laughs> he's full of energy. The owner, you know, she, she, you know, did complete check in her life, said, hell no, I still have things to do. I still have life to live. You know, she's full of ideas and, and going to start a new project and she's moving to a different place. So that's been like transformative. That's really interesting to see how much the owner, yeah, how much the owner um, impacted the dog. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're, you know, we're intertwined with our pets. Whatever we're feeling, they're feeling. You know, we're down there, down, we're up, they're up. It's like, and they, they're taking the energy. They're natural healers. So whatever you're feeling, they're going to absorb it, trying to help you out, but it's going to hit them harder. 
Mm. And animal communication, is this something that you have to do physically or is it something that you can do remotely, if that makes sense? It can be done remotely. You know, it's unbelievable. It's like, I don't even need to see like a pic. I mean, picture helps to focus, but it doesn't need to be a picture. Like if you tell me like the pet you're thinking of, I can start seeing that pet. I find it actually works better remotely because then I'm not so much affected by the energy of the owner. When you're like really close to the person, sometimes their own energy is just a little too powerful. Um, just being on the screen, it just gives me all the information I need without without me being stuck into the feelings of the owner. Because as an empath, you know, the, you're able to do it because you can feel what other people or animals are feeling. So if you have like a very dysregulated owner, sometimes it's really hard to like keep your balance you know, during the session. Um, so doing it remotely helps with that because then you can just channel exactly what you need to say without having necessarily part of that experience. So you kind of need to stay a little detached, you know, otherwise it's, it's an interesting thing because um, you do get, you know, you do get affected by those feelings. You know, if you have a session, like afterwards you need to do like reground and clear and because you, you're feeling those energies, you know, you are in it. And like subconsciously, you kind of absorb and just like a pet, you start absorbing, trying to take this load off the, you know, the owner's shoulders. And as a practitioner, you know, you start getting burned out. So just keeping the clear boundaries and clearing stuff out is really important in that, in that kind of field. Um, do you find that sometimes owners will contact you, but they're a little bit skeptical? Do you find that that happens? Yes. Yes. What I, what I like to offer, I say you pay at the end. Okay, so like if you, if it's, it's a money guaranteed, you know, if you're not crying the first five minutes, I'm not doing my job. It's usually so like straight to the point and it's so precise and so um, accurate that they just, you know, they usually just grab to their chairs, you know, they just like, how did that happen? You know, just a um, couple of times I had the owners, they just did not, I mean, they just came for a vet stop. They did not want the communication. So those are the ones, and in the past I used to, because I would see stuff, I'm like, this is going to help you, but they just buffle it, you know, they just say, I don't want it. And if the people don't want it, don't bring it up. You know, now I have a clear distinction if we're doing, you know, the vet work, that's one thing, if we're doing communication, then you're here to receive. You know, you can't force this information if somebody is not ready. Usually the ones that do come, they're ready. What people are unprepared for is like how much we're going to talk about their own issues and not their pet issues. The thing they're doing, the communication for the pet, but the pet says, I'm fine. Please take care of yourself. Like this problem, you need to do this and this and that. And nobody wants to do that. Like everybody just wants to, oh, what can I do for my pet? And I say, no, you need to take care of this. You need to let go of this anxiety. You need to, you know, quit this job. You need to, you know, end this relationship or start this relationship so you feel good and the pet's pro problems will resolve they'll be fine. Now back to end of life care. So beyond traditional um, veterinary care, which is obviously your background, what alternative or complementary approaches have you found effective in supporting dogs during their end of life care journey? You know, there's there's a lot, you know, there's a lot. It's like, think about like caring for the age relative, right? So you want to have like nutritious food. You want to have comfortable bedding, clean, you know, you have to the cleaning is a big issue end of life if there's a loss of bowel movements or bladder that's become like a really big thing and the animal's actually not as fussy about it as we are you know but for our own comfort you know keep their bed and clean i find the acupuncture works miracles you know if you can get acupuncturists to come in and even learning the acupressure yourself learn acupressure points can be really helpful in the good bonding time but when you you know in your pet um Really what's really required is just spend a lot of quiet time together. Just sit in, just not stressing. And uh, if the owner can start like letting go of attachment to this pet, you know, that helps them transition. Because if you're holding on tight to them and they know you need them so much, it makes it harder for them to go. They, they will drag their feet just so, you know, just so you have some company. So just reassuring them that you're okay so they can go on their own terms. You know, I like that visual um, cord cutting exercise. So when you imagine there's like, you know, this umbilical cord between you and your pet and you like imagine or like cut it. So you detach yourself from your pet because we're so like, we're, you know, we, we literally have a placenta, you know, between our pets, that's how close we are. So like cutting those cords so they can go on their own terms um, 
is really helpful and really just looking for support for yourself. That's what I would recommend. Find support group. Go talk to people, talk to therapists, talk to your family, like deal with your own grief so they can handle the experience and hero. Not much required for the pet, but a lot is needed for us to come to terms with it. Um, so 90% I would say focus on your own care and 10% just provide the needs for the pet. Don't obsess over the details. I have owners that you know, they'll spend, you know, days and weeks pounding, okay, can I add another supplement? Or is the water okay? Or is the water bowl is okay? It's like, it's like it's this all this little thing. You can, you can totally go down this rabbit hole. They just never stop. You know, it's just gonna, uh, and it's not needed. It's small. Just provide the basics. Take care of yourself. And when you're in a calm state, you're more likely to know what is actually needed than when you're like absolutely like spinning out of control, anxiety state where you can't sleep and you wake up and say, oh, maybe I need to do this. Like ground yourself, you know, use it as a, as a learning experience of what the life is really is. It's not like, you know, this pretty picture that it's stuck, you know, without changing. It's constantly changing, you know, it's constantly changing. So accepting the change, accepting the transition that's our lesson mm, I think you've summed it up really well but um just one last question if what is one thing that our pet owners can take away from this episode let go of the guilt just one thing if you can do one thing just drop the guilt just forgive yourself just whatever you've done whatever happened focus just ask the universe say can I please forgive myself and 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 whenever the guilt comes back just slap yourself say oh no, I'm good. I'm good. It's not helping. The guilt is not helping. You're not going to make right decisions when you feel guilty. Your pet is not mad at you no matter what you've done to them. They're extremely forgiven. And focusing on your own happiness is the best thing you can do for your pet's well-being. Lovely. I love that. So happy, yeah, happy you, happy pets. That's, that would be my take takeaway message. Thank you so much, Dr. Yushenko. It's such a lovely, um, lovely thing to talk to you, and I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. If our listeners want to find you, where can they find you? Do you have a website or social media? Oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm working on my website right now. It just does, you know, says that I do my vet work, so I want to transition it into the psychic website. It's in the building. So at the moment, it's my Instagram page at Path of Bliss Hawaii. That's where I put the latest updates. There it says what I do. You know, it's it, I put stories. I, you know, the story of Benji. If you want to look on the Benji, you know, he's he's my hero, the, from the grave to sailing, sailing the ocean. You know. And um, you know, directly by my phone number, if you want to give me a call at eight zero eight seven 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 eight two three five. That's two ways to get in touch with me for a moment. And uh, follow the platform, please. Pet Summit's been godsend. You know, they provided so much information They just from all different parts, just bringing all these holistic practitioners from around the world. You know, Alora is in Australia. I'm in Hawaii. You know, the founders in Bali, just like, and, and you know, these people can access it from just anywhere. You know, I think it's fascinating. I'm so grateful and so privileged to be on board. So, yeah, please follow, subscribe, and you'll hear more from us. Yep, you've summed it up really nicely. All our listeners need to follow and subscribe so they don't miss another episode. Um, but thank you, Dr. Yushenko. Um, we'll put some links to your pages in the show notes, um, and we'll see you next time for another episode. Thank you so much. And I want to make an announcement. We're making the End of Life Transition Workshop in September, so stay tuned for details. It's going to be all of this. But in more details and going to be Q&A at the end so you can ask your questions and hopefully you'll be empowered and you can help other people too so you can carry this message forward. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.